Hey guys, my name is Brad. I'm the lead pastor here at New Life Church, and I want to welcome you to our online teachings. One of our core convictions as a church is that everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. Now, I know that for some of us, coming into a church building might be intimidating, it might be scary, and I get that. But I want you to know that there is always a place for you here at New Life and that you were made for real in-person community. We meet on Sundays in downtown Wayland. You can check out our website for more information on service times. But for now, I hope God speaks powerfully to you through his word. Love you guys. Well, I want to just begin this morning uh, by giving you an update uh, for us as a church. This is a little bit of a family conversation. Um, and uh, maybe you grew up in a home where family conversation was a bad thing. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. This is a good family conversation. So if you've been around New Life for the last several months, you know that we've been talking uh, pretty extensively about the old Snap Fitness space next door to our space, uh, and that we've actually started the renovation process of that. And so walls are being framed right now. It's actually open after the service, so feel free to go ahead and walk in there, check it out. It's right next door. Uh, we'd love to invite you uh, to go take a look at that. Uh, but one of the things that um, I believe is really important for us as a church is uh, we really believe that God is going to use that space to impact a generation for Jesus. Uh, we believe that through that space and the free hygiene products that we're going to be giving out in our essential store to the community, that God is going to draw people to himself through that space. You know, when I first started at New Life a couple years ago, there was a lot of buzz and a lot of talk about that space and making that a youth center. And I really felt convicted that the first step before taking on that space was to hire a youth pastor and really get a youth group up and going. And uh, I'm thrilled to say that has happened over the last couple of years. We have a vibrant youth group. Yeah, that's super, super important, super exciting. And so now, now is the time to renovate that space, to build out that space, to take it on um, so that our youth and, and people in our community can be impacted for the person of Jesus. And so I want to just give you a couple details as far as where we're at in the process on that space. So if you want to go to that next slide there, um, we are in the process of renovating right now. And our goal for having the space completed is August 1st. Now, if you know anything about construction, that's a loose timeline at this point. Uh, but our goal is to be in there by time uh, school starts. And so we're going to be putting three new classrooms in there for kids and students. I actually had somebody come by and say, hey, I have some arcade games that I'd love to like rotate through the space. And so we might have an arcade for students over there, which is really cool. Um, we're doing the essential store, which is the hygiene store in the front there, as well as a large open space for kids and students just to be able to be kids and students and get their energy out, run around, have fun. And yes, a giant hole is going to be blown through that wall with some doors so that it feels like all one space for us as a church. And so we're really, really, really excited about what God's already doing through that space. I was actually talking to uh, Mark Van Volkenberg, who's doing the construction for the space um, yesterday, and he t was telling me that normally when you submit a request for a building permit, it can take weeks to get back. And uh, he, he submitted it in a, on a morning, and by the afternoon they had called back and they said, we really believe in your project and what you're doing. We're going to approve it, and we're not going to require any architectural blueprints or drawings, which literally saves us thousands of dollars on the project. So that's really, I mean, that's worth celebrating. And there's been story after story like that along the way of just God's miraculous provision for us. And so maybe you're sitting here and you're wondering, okay, what, like, what do we need to do over this next season as a church to lean in and to really see the space come to life by August 1st? Uh, well, one of the biggest pieces of this is obviously the financial component of it. Uh, we price things out and we have kind of done everything we can to make costs as low as possible. We want to be good stewards of what God has given us. And so the renovation budget for the space is 75000 is is the number that we've set for renovating the space. Uh, which may sound like a lot. That may sound like not much to you. I don't know. Uh, but just for frame of reference, the space you're sitting in right now, the renovation budget for this space was around 200000 So we are really doing everything we can to keep costs low uh, because we know things are expensive right now. And uh, it's been a crazy year for so many of us. 
And one thing that's really cool about this number, 75,000, because I believe God can do this, I believe we can raise this money, um, is that of that 75,000, we've already had 30,000 given towards the project, which is incredibly, incredibly exciting uh, because we haven't even talked about these numbers yet. This is the first time I'm getting on the stage talking about these numbers to the church. And so here's what I just want to ask from you this morning. We don't do this every week. This is kind of a unique thing. Uh, But my job as a pastor is just to lay out the vision, to say, I believe God is calling us to lean into this space, that every single conversation I've had with people in the church, and I've had a lot of them about this space, that we collectively believe God is calling us to walk through these doors to take the next steps, to boldly commit ourselves to this as the next season of our church. And uh, we really believe that. We really believe that. And so I want to ask you this morning just to pray about how God might be calling or leading your family to contribute towards this. Um, It's going to take all of us leaning in to make this a reality, to make this happen. Uh, But I believe in a God who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. I believe in a God who desires to see us take this space on and see lives be transformed because of this space and the relationships that are built there. And so if you feel God leading you to contribute towards this space, uh, whatever the amount may be, I want to just challenge you, don't give what is comfortable. Give what God is calling you to give towards it. Um, And I believe that in our faithful obedience, our steps of faith, God is going to move really, really powerfully. And so there's a couple ways you can give towards it. The first is on our website, newlifewayland.org slash give. There's a little drop-down menu um, for the renovation budget, or there's a box in the back for giving, and you can give that way. Just put a little memo note on there for the renovation. So with that being said, I'd love to just pray over the space, um, pray over the next season for us as a church, and uh, then we'll jump into our teaching this morning. God, you are so faithful to us. And while this year has been anything but predictable, lots of pivoting and lots of highs and lows and God, people out of jobs, people having to change jobs during this season, God, you have proven yourself faithful. And so God, I pray that as a church, that where you are tapping us on the shoulder to step up and to contribute and to give towards making this new space a reality, a space that so many of our, in our church have dreamed about for years and years, God. I pray that we will respond as a church in generosity and that we will give boldly so that your kingdom can come in our area, in Wayland, in Allegan, Otsego, Plainwell, as it is in heaven, God. This is bigger than us. This is bigger than what we are capable of. Uh, But God, you are even bigger than that. And so God, we love you and we trust you and we step forward in faith that you will provide. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So there is a guy that I heard about the other day named Rob Kenny. Rob Kenny. And as a child, Rob's dad actually left their house. In fact, it He was 14 years old, and it was at his sister's birthday party where his dad said, I no longer want to be a father, and he left. And like would happen with any child, this would radically rock your world. It would change so many things for you. And for Rob, what it did is it ignited in him a passion to stand in the gap of fatherlessness for other kids. In fact, just... A little while ago, Rob started a YouTube channel called Dad, How Do I? And in this YouTube channel, he does all kinds of different videos about how to do things that a father would typically teach his kids. So things like, Dad, how do I tie a tie? Dad, how do I change a tire or unclog a sink? And within a few weeks, this YouTube channel had 2 million subscribers. Two million people following along. He answers questions like, Dad, how do I read a woman's mind? (laughs) Which is impossible. No, he doesn't have a video for that. Uh, But there's a reason, I think, why this YouTube channel got so popular so incredibly quickly. 
It's because Rob understands something that I think sometimes I miss and maybe sometimes you miss as well. Rob understands that your greatest contribution is not something you do, but it's someone you raise up. Your greatest contribution is not simply something you do, it's someone you raise up. And the same thing is true in the kingdom of God and in the church. Your greatest contribution is not something, it's someone you pour into. It's someone you serve, it's someone you elevate and raise up. See, we have kids ministry volunteers in those rooms over there. And yes, some of them are wiping dirty noses and changing poopy diapers. And we are so thankful for that. But that is not the most important thing they're doing over there. The most important thing over there is who they're raising up. And we see this pattern throughout the entirety of the Bible. It's a word we call discipleship, where it's raising somebody else up in the ways of Jesus, in the ways of what it means to be a person of God. From the very beginning, Moses raises up Joshua. Eli raises up Samuel. Samuel raises up David. Uh, Mordecai raises up Esther. We see Jesus raising up Peter. We see Paul raising up Timothy. Are we seeing a pattern here in the scriptures that the most important thing you do or contribute is not something you do. Rather, it's someone you raise. Friends, it doesn't matter how fast you run the race. If you don't pass the baton off successfully to the next runner, we lose the race. The race was for nothing if we don't successfully pass the baton on to the next generation. And so I want to begin today, Maureen, if you want to throw up that slide, how are we doing in this? How are we doing, next slide there, in raising up others in the church today? Well, I have good news and I have bad news. What do you want first? The bad news? You get the bad news. Um, The bad news is 50%. 50% of high schoolers leave faith after they graduate. That's one in two. If you're like my family, we have three young kids, one, two, three. That means one to two of them leave faith after they graduate high school. And I have a guess as to which one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> that was a joke. I'm not allowed to say that. Uh, 50% of, of kids, students, leave faith after they graduate high school. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, well, maybe those are the students who were dragged kicking and screaming to the church, who had no desire to be in the church whatsoever. But that's actually not true. Of those students who left their faith, 80% of those students had every intention of sticking with faith. These aren't the students that were dragged to church unwillingly by their parents. These are the students that were bringing their friends to youth group. These are the students who were faithfully serving. These are the students who were in youth group every single week. 80% of the students that leave the church intended to stick with their faith. That's the bad news. You see, there's a massive divide growing between generations. In fact, when I look on social media, and I follow a lot of different people of a lot of different age groups, I see the divide widening between generations right now, between values, between political beliefs and opinions, between culture. The gap is widening, and the bitterness is growing between generations. And you can blame culture. You can blame tic-tac, tic-tac, not tic-tac, You can blame TikTok, you can blame Hollywood, you can blame LeBron, you can blame whoever you want. You can use hell in a handbasket language or pick any cultural war issue that you feel like the church might be losing and point to that as the reason we're losing a generation. And that might be valid, but I'm far more interested in taking a look in the mirror And saying, are we doing everything we can as a church to reach the next generation for the person of Jesus? Are we doing everything we can as a church to raise up the next generation? And so today we're going to look at a story in scripture of the power of raising up the next generation. Because I believe that this generation that we might be at risk of losing in the church, if we do this right, 
that same generation becomes our greatest opportunity for revival. Our greatest opportunity to see a move of the Holy Spirit like we've never seen in our lifetimes before. So today we're going to go on a journey with two men, Elijah and Elisha. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. And as you're turning there, just to set the stage, Elijah is nearing the end of his life. He, have, he has more years behind him than he has in front of him. And God is calling Elijah, who has been one of the greatest prophets Israel has ever seen, to call his successor. And I want you to watch what happens here. So Elijah departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh, which sounds gross, but somebody pointed out to me at first service, that's pretty much just stew, boiling the flesh. It's dinner. With the yokes of oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. So like I said, Elijah is an old guy. He's got more years behind him than he's got ahead of him. And Elijah is told by God to go find his successor. And what Elijah does, what does he do? He tosses his cloak on Elisha. Now, don't do that to a young person because you'll get the cops called on you. But but Elisha would have known exactly what this meant. It would not have been weird or creepy or anything like that because for a prophet to go toss his cloak on another, it meant that 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 person was taking on the burden of a prophet, that the calling on Elijah's life was being passed on to the person of Elisha. That's what it meant to throw a cloak on someone else. Metaphorically speaking, it was passing a baton. It would have been abundantly clear exactly what Elijah was doing, and Elisha would have thought nothing weird about it. In fact, he would have been honored that a prophet as great as Elijah was passing his cloak, his mantle, his burden, his calling onto Elisha. This was a symbol of... The burden a prophet carried, the calling on his life, but it was also a symbol of adoption or sonship. And so when a prophet cast his cloak on another, it was saying, I am adopting you as my spiritual child, and you are going to walk in my ways as we follow God together. This is the rhythm of discipleship that you see all throughout the scriptures from Genesis to the end of scripture and Revelation. And the reality is, is that if you are a follower of Jesus, if you would call yourself a Christian in this room or watching online, you too have a baton baton to pass to the next generation. Just like Elijah, you have a cloak, a mantle to toss on the next generation, metaphorically, of course. Maybe your mantle to pass on the next generation is your story. The story of how God has radically transformed your life. Maybe for you, your mantle that you are called to pass on to the next generation are the mistakes you've made and the lessons you've learned from them. Maybe your mantle or your baton to pass on to the next generation is the humble service of another person, modeling what it means to elevate others at the expense of elevating yourself. Maybe your mantle is your time or your gifting For followers of Jesus, our mantle is taking up our cross daily, denying ourselves so that others can see the person of Jesus. Parents in the room, do your kids know your faith story? Do they know the story of how you came to know Jesus? Parents, do they, do your kids know and see you confessing your sins, repenting of your sins? Do they see you modeling that in front of them? Adults in the room who maybe aren't parents, adults in the church, do you know names of students in our church? Do you know the names of students in our community? Are you praying for middle and high school students who are far from God? Have you taken the time 
to learn their unique stories, the unique pressures that this generation is under because they're different than the way you grew up. There's different pressures that students are under. And we can, we can compare and say one is harder and one is easier, and I'm not all that interested in doing that. What I'm interested in doing is walking with students and the unique pressures that they have here and now and today. Friends, if you are in Christ... You have a baton, you have a mantle to pass, and it is both a responsibility and a privilege to pass it on to the next generation. Amen. And so Elijah, Elijah and Elisha, they start a journey together. After Elisha decides to follow Elijah and become his apprentice, these two men start a journey together towards the end of Elijah's life. And I'm going to tell you next week, I'm going to talk to students, okay? So I'm going to talk to the Elishas and what it means to actually give your life to something and follow something. But today I want to talk to the older generation who has a baton to pass to the next generation. And so what happens is Elijah and Elisha go on a journey. And the, the writer of First and Second Kings includes some really important details about where they stop on this journey, Details that I believe we can learn from when it comes to how to pass the mantle on to the next generation. And so just a couple chapters later in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, they stop at their first location together on the way to Elijah being taken up. This is what it says. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Okay, so let's pause there. So they're, they're in a place called Gilgal. Now, Gilgal was a location that had a school of prophets at the time. So other prophets being raised up in the way of God. And for Elijah and Elisha to stop at this location called Gilgal would have been incredibly significant for both of them. Because it was in this place where God removed Israel's shame. See, after Israel had crossed over the Jordan River and into the promised land, they built an altar of 12 stones, remembering God's faithfulness to the generations and anticipating his promises in the promised land. See, Gilgal is the place where Israel finally realized that their best days were not behind them in Egypt, but were actually in front of them in the promised land. Gilgal, I brought things to represent each stop on our journey this morning. So I brought a rear view mirror to represent Gilgal. Because what Gilgal represents is that there are a lot of older people in the church who I believe believe the best days of the church are behind us. Here's the problem, though. You cannot drive by solely looking in a rearview mirror. Rearview mirror is useful for remembering, for reference, for learning from, even for honoring, but you cannot drive by looking into a rearview mirror. When you are in Christ, and for Christ church, the best days are always ahead of us, not behind us that there may be good parts behind us, there may be good parts of Egypt and wilderness wandering, but friends, the promised land is still ahead. Amen. And I got to tell you, this season has flipped our church in so many different ways, like it has every single church, every single organization, every single family. It has thrown all of us for tailspins. And I had a realization the other day uh, that I've actually been the pastor of New Life longer in COVID than out of COVID. Okay, so it's been about two years that I've been at New Life, and it's been longer in COVID than outside of COVID. And what I realized this last week is I've really been grieving that. I've really been grieving the good old days of New Life, even though I didn't get a lot of exposure to them uh, before COVID hit. And there was a spiritual mentor, a spiritual advisor in the church that really called me out on that this last week. And he said, are you too busy pining over what was? to miss the new thing that God desires to do in our community, to miss the celebration of the new thing that God desires to do. You see, the church looks different, and it's going to continue looking different. The message of Jesus doesn't change, but the methods in which we spread that, in which we reach the next generation, they have to change. They changed in the New Testament itself as you read along. 
The methods in which we reach the next generation change, and so we cannot be a church who simply drives by looking in the rearview mirror. Amen. We must be a church that continues to look forward to the promise land ahead. This is the lesson of Gilgal. Elijah and Elisha continue moving forward, and I want you to take a look at where they stop next in verse 2 here. And Elijah said to Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now Bethel is also a really significant place, one in which this would not have been lost on. And there was also a school of the prophets that was located in Bethel when Elijah and Elisha would have visited. See, Bethel is the place where Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord. Where Jacob, throughout the entire night, wrestled with God. We believe the angel of the Lord was pre-incarnate Jesus. And they wrestle with each other. And what happens at the end is the angel touches Jacob's hip. And from that point on, Jacob walks with a limp because of his wrestling with God. See, here's the thing, guys. If you are on a faith journey, you're going to wrestle with God you are going to have doubts. You are going to have questions, and anybody tells you you don't is a liar. <laughs> You're going to have struggles. And I think one of the worst things that we can do for the next generation is try to hide the wounds and the struggles behind our back. To pretend like there are neat, easy fixes, easy answers for every single complex question that students have. Our students on Sunday nights are asking some really complex questions about God and about Jesus. They are not easy questions to answer. In fact, some of them don't have answers readily available to, uh, to them. And what I love about Jacob's story at Bethel is that he holds on to the person of Jesus during the wrestling. He says, God, I will not let you go until you bless me. In the midst of the wrestling, in the midst of the struggles, in the midst of the questions, does the younger generation see us holding on to the person of Jesus, even if we don't have all the answers all the time? Or do they see us just dismissing them and their questions and their doubts and their struggles, trying to provide easy answers for really complex questions? My wife and I have this thing in our relationship where if one of us was, is struggling with something and we go to the other, we actually have started defining, are you asking me to fix this for you or are you asking me just to sit in this with you? How many other couples have navigated some of that before? We have a tendency, don't we, to want to fix things for people. And I think that's what we do with students a lot, right? They'll ask really complex questions and we'll dismiss them and say, or we'll just say, you know, here's an overly simplistic answer for your complex question and then we'll send them on their way. Students, most of the time, are not asking us to fix their questions for them. Most of the time, what they're asking us to do is to be willing to sit with them in the midst of them, to say some of the most powerful words an older person can say to a younger person, I don't know, but I'm willing to journey with you and find out. That's the lesson of Bethel where our struggles, our doubts, our wounds, our wrestling with God are on full display to see that he is faithful, that he does not let us go, and that he is glorified in the midst of them. Don't hide your wounds from the next generation. Don't hide your limp from the next generation. Show the next generation what God can do in the midst of that. And then the next stop, and this will be the final one we look at today, reading on in verse 4 here as they keep walking. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now, who knows what happened to Jericho? Probably a couple of us. We talked about it this summer. Jericho is the very first place that Israel conquered after they entered into the promised land. It's the very first city they laid siege to. Now, Elijah and Elisha, once again, they stop at Jericho on their journey, 
And here's the craziest part. There's another school of prophets in Jericho. This is another really significant place because Jericho represents the place where faith-filled obedience leads to breakthrough. Where when we respond to God in faith for things that feel too big for ourselves, that God shows up in some really powerful ways. It's where walls come down as a result of faith. brought a carpet square to represent Jericho. Because guys, I got to tell you, that space next door feels bigger than any one person. That space next door, $75,000, it feels bigger than me, probably feels bigger than you. But I believe that if we are willing right here and right now to take bold steps of faith for the next generation, just like Israel did in Jericho, that we will see strongholds loosed in people's lives, that we will see spiritual chains fall off, that we will see walls come tumbling down through something as simple as a hygiene store and a youth space where people can come and know, be known and be loved and belong to something bigger than themselves. Are we willing right now to take the faith-filled steps that God requires so that the walls of Jericho come down? Are we willing to march around Jericho? Part of passing on the mantle to the next generation is bold steps of faith that don't always make sense, that don't always have answers in the natural, that sometimes might feel risky or unsafe. The next generation does not want us to play it safe for the kingdom of God. They want us to risk boldly. And I believe when we do, we actually show the next generation that we believe this thing. We're smoking what we sell. (laughs) We actually buy into this when we're willing to take bold steps of faith here and now, even when they don't make sense. Can you imagine the legacy of faith that we pass on to the next generation when we do this? Can you imagine the witness and the testimony that that provides to the next generation that we actually believe this thing that we're talking about? Psalm 71, David wrote this psalm at the very end of his life when he's old and gray, and this is what he says. He says, let me proclaim your power to this new generation. He says, let me talk about your mighty works, your mighty miracles to all who come after me. This is the lesson of Jericho. I was in youth ministry for about a decade And during that time, I got to work with all kinds of different volunteers, all kinds of different students. And one of the volunteers that I'll always remember was an older woman named Bonnie. And Bonnie and I first exchanged emails, um, and she said literally no joke in her first email, um, I'd love to meet after I go to the gym if you're okay sitting with an old smelly lady in your office. I was like, great, perfect. Um, and, uh, so we sit there and she's interested in running our student cafe where we sell, you know, drinks and snacks and things like that. And so she asked me in our first meeting, well, do you have spreadsheets for this cafe? Do you have a business plan? I'm like, lady, we sell M&Ms and Coke for a dollar. Okay. I don't have spreadsheets for our, our youth cafe. Okay. She's like, well, I'm going to make you spreadsheets and I'm going to get this whole thing in order. And I thought to myself, man, like she, like, is this going to be a good fit? And I know she was thinking the same thing as well. And so we said, okay, we'll, we'll do this trial run. You can serve in youth ministry. You can run the cafe. And the location of the cafe for us as, in student ministry was right. It was the first thing you saw when you walked in the doors for youth group was this cafe. And Bonnie served faithfully for years and years and years. And yes, she brought in spreadsheets and business plans and all of those different things, but she also learned what the students wanted in the cafe, what their favorite snacks were. She also talked to them after having a really hard day at school. She prayed with students at that cafe. She learned their stories. She built trust. She poured into them, she invested in them, and she served for years as the head of that cafe. And I just got a message from Bonnie just a couple days ago saying, 
that saying yes in my office was one of the best decisions she ever made in her whole life because it transformed things for her. That's the story of Bonnie, and that's the opportunity that we have to invest in the next generation. I shared at the beginning that I have bad news and I have good news. Let me share the good news for you. Those half, those 50% of students that stick with the church, they all had one thing in common. And it wasn't a silver bullet, and it's not a magical formula, but there is one thing they all shared that they had Elijah's in their life, that they had Bonnie's in their life, that they knew that people, adults in the church, were deeply invested in their stories, in their struggles, in their questions. That was one of the biggest determinations as to whether or not a student graduated and kept faith. Do they have Elijah's in their life? You know, I think about people in our church here. I sat down with... Um, a woman named Suzanne McIntosh the other day. And Suzanne is a teacher in our local schools, has been for many, many years. And uh, Suzanne sat down with me and she talked about the faith of my daughter, Emery, who's five years old. Emery's right there. Hi, babe. (laughs) She talked about her faith. And I told Suzanne, I said, my hope is that when Emery is 19 years old, And she is telling her faith story of why she loves Jesus, that Suzanne, your name is a name she mentions. I think of Brad Molker. He's a volunteer for our middle schoolers. He came to me after service last week and he said, you know, my my middle school group of guys is asking questions I don't know the answers to. They're wrestling deeply with some faith questions and I don't know where to point them, but I care about journeying with them towards that. So I was able to provide some resources for him. And Brad Molker is now journeying with students in the midst of their questions, because here's the thing. If we want to recapture the next generation for Jesus, we need Elijah's, we need Bonnie's, we need Brad Molker's, we need Suzanne's investing in those people, because your greatest contribution is not something you do. It's someone you're raising up. And that is the power of Jesus' mission of discipleship. That our mission is not a what, it's a who. So I want to end today by asking you this question, who will you raise up? Who will you raise up? Maybe after service, you need to go find our youth pastor, Josh, who was up here earlier because you believe God is calling you to invest in this next generation of students, to walk with them, to journey with them. Maybe for you, it's responding in faith to God calling you to contribute financially to a space next door. And that's a big faith step for you to raise somebody else up. Maybe you're a parent and you have kids who have friends coming in the home and their name is, is ringing in your ear right now. One of your kids' friends and you are called to raise them up, to pray for them, to invest in them, to hear more of their story. No matter what your age in this place, no matter whether you're married or you have kids or you're somewhere in between, who will you raise up? Who will you journey ahead with? Who will you disciple? Who will you pour into? Let me pray for us, and then we are going to respond this morning in worship. God, thank you for how good you are. Thank you that you are faithful, that you are consistent, that even when we feel like Maybe our world is really uncertain that you are not, God. And God, I pray for this next generation, a generation that is being pulled in a thousand different directions, culturally and socially, a generation that is being discipled and formed by entertainment and celebrity. God, I pray that you will recapture a generation's heart and that you will use people who take this really seriously to do just that. God, we love you. 
And the only reason we love you is because you first loved us. And so it's in your holy and matchless name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen.